Hey, is the 30 out 6 really a versatile cartridge? And what exactly do we mean by a versatile cartridge? Well, we're going to find out on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. But that's not all. We're also going to answer the question on everyone's mind. What the heck does BC stand for? And does it matter? Stay tuned. Hi, everyone. Say, before I dive into these topics and more, I just want to bring to your attention a book that I am holding up right now for those of you watching, uh, for those of you on podcast. The name of the book is Cougars on the Cliff, One Man's Pioneering Quest to Understand the Mythical Mountain Lion, a memoir. And this was written by a friend of mine who was a he worked with me up in Lewiston, Idaho, on the newspaper up there for years. And this was a long time ago. And he is helping write this book with Morris Hornacker, who is a famous biologist who studied the first real study of cougars. He did this in the central Idaho wilderness um, in Idaho in the 1960s. I think he started around 1964, and that study ran until about 1973 or so. And he really opened the door to understanding cougars. And of course, had a grand adventure while he was doing it. He hired a local wild man living out in that country. No roads, only access was with a small plane when the weather allowed it. And this guy was living with his um, hounds and hunting cougar out there. So uh, the biologist here, a student at the time, Morris Hornacker, he hired this guy and the two of them spent the winters tracking and treeing cougars and then radio collaring them and tr and following their tracks and just figuring out what the heck these animals did and how they did it. It's really quite an amazing story. And uh, I met uh, Mr. Hornacker when I lived up in that part of Idaho. And I think you might enjoy this book if you are interested in wildlife and why they do what they do, and especially the mountain lion. Now, let's get to our cartridge and ballistics questions. 30 at 6 versatility from Russell. Russell is a patron of ours, and I always address our patrons' questions as quickly as I can. Russell wrote this. Everyone talks about how versatile the 30 out 6 is, but why is that said? And what does versatile mean? I can understand uh, that they kill all sorts of game out to reasonable distance, but how does it do it recreationally? Fun, target shooting, familiarization, etc. Is recoil taken into account when it's spoken of as versatile? Is it more versatile than a 308 because it can hold more powder? Or is it the length of time on the market that has allowed companies to make a variety of factory ammunition for it, which people have bought, which keeps this demand supply loop thing going? <laughs> or is there a more deeply rooted reason that has got the biggest variety of ammo available? I recall a a bit of an episode where you mentioned that too little powder in a large casing can be dangerous. Does that influence the OT6 versatility? Or is that why the OT6 is versatile? Because the case capacity isn't too big. <laughs> oh my goodness. Maybe if you have an OT6, why buy any other rifle larger than a 22 or smaller than a 33? Does it handily reach down in grain weights, usually occupied by the top end of the 24 grain weights, and reach up to the lower end of the 33s? Whew. Finally, can the OT6 be relied on to reasonably well at target shooting? This question stems from me being a one-gun guy. Since I don't have the budget nor live where I access, have ex access to public land, to fully enjoy using a variety of centerfire cartridges. All right, Russell, I'm going to try to answer your question here as I wrote you already. Good questions, and you've touched on a lot of the answers. The main reason the 30 out 6 is called versatile is because it's big enough, but not overly big and overly powerful for most of us to handle. And it takes everything from bunnies to buffalo. An elephant, really. The second reason it's versatile is because it stabilizes and shoots accurately bullets from 100 to 220 grains, sometimes even 230 grains, in the standard 1 to 10 twist barrels. Third, it can be downloaded to shoot 100 grain plinkers to about 1,550 feet per second for small game. Fourth, it'll push 110 grain spire point 3,400 feet per second for varmints and coyotes. Fifth, a 100 to 25, 130 grain at 3,200 to 3,300 feet per second makes it a great pronghorn and coyote getter. 
Sixth, when shooting 150 to 180 grain, uh, deer, elk, kudu, moose, general big game loads, it provides 2,800 to 3,000 foot-pounds of muzzle energy, proven deadly power levels that are enhanced by relatively high sectional densities of 0.226 through 0.271 for those bullets. Seventh reason, the 30-06 can be and has been a fine target cartridge. It has won thousands of competitions and once owned some world records. It's not widely used now because short actions are usually stiffer, thus more precise, and that's why the 308 is known as a target cartridge. All that said, the 30 6 is known as versatile in large part because so many folks repeat that description of it, much like they repeat the 308 Winchester is the most inherently accurate sniper round. In reality, many 7mm and 30 calibers can be equally versatile. The real problem with all of this versatility is that the one gun owner must be regularly fiddling with loads and zeros. It's not like you can roll out and shoot 110 grain one day and 190 grain the next without needing to re-zero your scope. A couple of marked or memorized settings can simplify this, but not across the whole bullet weight and shape spectrum. And that doesn't include memorizing trajectory tables. Versatility can be a useful thing, but most shooters and hunters have figured out it's easier, albeit more expensive, to own several specific rifles for spe specific uses. Thus, the famous U.S. options in calibers from 17 through 50. <laughs> a lot to choose from. Cheers! So, I hope that answers the question. Do you guys know of other reasons why we call the 30 out 6 versatile than the ones I covered there? Uh, that pretty much spells it out for me. It's just capable of doing pretty much anything and everything that a hunter and or target shooter would want to do. Now, Mike is asking us about 270 Winchesters and those new fast twist barrels. He's got a new spin on this one. Ron, I appreciate how you give straight answers and cut through the hype, particularly regarding some of the classic hunting cartridges, like the 30 at 6 and the 270 Winchester. Some forums online make it sound like you're hunting with a flintlock and a musket ball if you still use these cartridges. Thanks for your printouts showing how closely the ballistics for these compare to some of the more modern cartridges. In a recent podcast, you answered a question about the 270 Winchester with a fast twist barrel. I like my 270 Browning X-Bolt very much, and they're now offering some of their models with a fast twist barrel in 270. Do you think that the high BC bullets will be available in factory loads, or will they be the provenance of hand loaders only? Are there any comparisons of the 270 with a fast twist versus the 6.5 Creedmoor or the 6.5 PRC? And would the 270 with a fast twist and heavier bullets, say 165 grains to 175 grains, outperform the 6.5 PRC as a hunting cartridge with less recoil than the 6.8 Western? Thanks for considering my questions, best Mike. P.S. You can never go wrong with Covey in more of your videos. <laughs> so I wrote Mike back, said, hey, Mike, Covey, thanks you for reminding me. As far as the fast twist 270 Winchester goes, it'll obviously fall between the 6.8 Western and the 6.5. Because the 6.8 has more powder capacity, you'd want a higher BC bullets mainly to help with your wind deflection. More drop for less wind is the trade-off. I have a pretty good hunch the 270 will outshoot the Creedmoor, but not the PRC. Obviously, the best way to nail this down is to run ballistics trajectories with each. But as far as ammunition, that is really the good question right here, Mike. I don't know that if manufacturers are going to offer it. Uh, you would think so with uh, the manufacturers offering fast twist barrels in 270 Winchester. That would be a demand for, obviously, ammunition with those bullets. But they always run that risk of confusing standard 270 users. And there are so many of them out there. And I would imagine if... Yes, yeah, some guy with a 270 win went to the store and said, oh, look, 175 grain bullets. That is perfect for my moose hunt. Picks them up and finds they don't stabilize in his, his rifle. And then he's upset. So I don't know. It, it seems to me they could 
um, put a big warning on the box or something and say for fast twist, new 270s only or something, and it would work out. So maybe they will do that. And I don't suppose it would hurt at all for most of us to um, sort of weigh in on this and call your favorite ammo companies and let them know you're interested in it because you're going to buy a fast twist barrel. And then maybe they'll come up with them. That's a good point, though. A lot of people think, oh, boy, fast twist barrel, and they just buy the rifle and don't consider having ammunition for it. Of course, once again, hand loaders, <laughs> you've got your solution. Now, let's get to this BC question. Um, this gentleman goes by the uh, online initials CSH. Okay, Ron, I realize you're you're being the most expert among experts. So, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> that is, you run your channel as a course for guys who come to you for a refresher. But some of your viewers are novices who pick up a rifle maybe twice a year. Wants to sight it in and wants to go hunting. <laughs> I remember those days. Now, for those of us who are like that, please define BC. I guess BC means ballistic coefficient. But what does that mean? Hey, I love your channel, by the way. But you always mention BC, but you never quite define it. So it remains elusive, like that buck I haven't gotten yet. <laughs> You're pretty funny there, CSH. P.S. You look like an uncle of mine who stopped hunting several years ago. He was the most outdoorsy of my grandfather's sons. Your singing, by the way, is just fine. Oh, well, CSH must have listened to a recent podcast in which I did, <laughs> took the risk of singing. <laughs> well, that might have been on a main channel. I don't know. I caught a lot of grief for that one. But hey, I appreciate it. Now, I need to answer the question, what is BC? And you are right, sir. It stands for ballistic coefficient. But what is that? It is uh, a number that we use to we'll place them on a bullet, and it tells us roughly how that bullet lands in a spectrum of really low aerodynamic efficiency to high aerodynamic efficiency. And, you know, the num numbers are sort of arbitrary, but a low example of a low BC number would be 0.150. That's really low, probably a short flat-nosed bullet with straight sides, no taper to the nose, no sharp look to it. You can kind of see BC in a bullet when you look at it. If the bullet looks long and sleek like a race car or a missile, it probably has a high BC. If it looks short and dumpy and flat-nosed, it's not got a high BC because it's pushing air out of the way. It's not aerodynamically efficient. So I think a quick definition is BC describes how aerodynamically efficient a projectile is. So let's see, what else can I say about BC? It is made up of three things. I don't know exactly how they figure this out and do all the math, but you have to consider the mass of the bullet, how much it weighs, its diameter, and its form how it is shaped. All of those things will contribute to how efficiently it can move through the air, aerodynamic efficiency. Now, a lot of people write in and say, oh, enough with this BC nonsense. It's all a bunch of bull. It doesn't matter inside of 300 yards. It's just for those long range freaks that are shooting too far in the first place. But that's not quite true. And I want to show you some numbers on performance. And it's more than just the bullets drop or even the wind deflection, all those, those are fairly significant. So I want to take some extremes here. Let's go with a round-nosed bullet. We're going to use a 308 Winchester, shoot 150 grain bullet. One will have a round nose, straight sides, no boat tail, kind of a low BC bullet. And the actual BC of this round nose bullet is 0.186, pretty low. And they're also going to compare it to the 150 grain that does have a boat tail and a sharp tip nose for a higher BC. And that one's coming in at 0.415. So a significant difference in your BCs. Let's shoot them both at a muzzle velocity of 2,800 feet per second. That means they both leave the barrel carrying 2,612 foot pounds of energy. Now let's see what happens downrange. Now I'm going to zero these for a maximum point blank range and we don't want to go any higher than 100 yards or over three inches at 100 yards. We don't want our bullets to rise more than three inches from our line of sight. So that's going to happen at about 100 yards. Doing that means that we sight the um, 1.86 
round nose, low BC bullet, we're going to zero that guy at 210 yards. That means at 100 yards, it's 2.87 inches above your line of sight. At 125 yards, it's three inches above your line of sight. Then it begins to fall. By 200 yards, it's dropped three quarters of an inch from your line of sight. And you just look at those numbers and say, well, heck, I can not only hit every deer I aim at, I can probably get every coyote I aim at because my bullet's not going more than three inches above my line of sight. And it's only not even one inch below my line of sight, all the way out to 200 yards. So in that case, I think you're fine. Now let's compare that to the higher BC bullet at 0.415. That one we are able to zero at 235 yards and keep that bullet under that three inch height. So it is landing 2.75 inches high at 100 yards, three inches high at 125 yards, and at 200 yards, it's still 1.75 inches high. It doesn't drop but an inch out to 250 yards. So you've gained a little distance at which you can keep it going. In fact, you can get all the way to 275 yards before it drops three inches. So there's an advantage on your drops. Now let's look at what happens with the wind blowing 10 miles an hour from a right angle to your shot. With the round nose bullet with a low BC at 200 yards, you're getting just over eight inches of wind deflection. You're only getting three and a quarter inches of wind deflection out of the uh, pointier bullet with the higher BC. So there's a significant advantage there. Go out to 300 yards, which a lot of folks say you're good with any BC. It doesn't really matter. At 300 yards, you're getting 20 inches of deflection out of the round nose and less than eight inches in your sharp nosed higher BC bullet. So it does matter. Now, Final category, if you don't care about the wind drifts and the drops, what about energy? Remember, they're both starting off with the same energy. At 100 yards, the energy has dropped to 1,800 foot-pounds for the 308 with the round nose bullet. And it's still up at 2,221 with the sharp-tipped higher BC bullet. Eh, big deal. I don't think any deer or elk is going to notice the difference. But what happens at 200 yards? At 200 yards, you're down to 1,207 on the round nose, and you're staying up at 1,878. This could make a difference on an elk or a moose. Out there at 300 yards, whoo boy, 785 foot-pounds of energy in that round nose bullet compared to 1,578 in the sharply tipped bullet. I think that is a significant difference. So BC does matter. I wouldn't just write it off and say, who cares? It pays to know this stuff and apply it. Doesn't say that you can't get by with round nose bullets with low BCs, but you do need to understand you're sacrificing ballistics and energy, and it makes a difference. All right. That was kind of long-winded, but appreciate your attention there, folks. Now we're going to see what they've got here on the computer for us. All right, this is Robert from Texas. Ron, you often talk about traveling to exotic hunts or competitions. Well, not competitions. I'm not a competitor. That made me wonder about traveling with guns. Can you share some knowledge with us about how to do so? Good question. This comes up fairly often. It's a bit intimidating for folks who haven't done it, but it's really not that difficult. They're always trying to throw roadblocks in our way here. You know how the anti-gun stuff goes. but as a general rule, here's what it's like flying with guns. You need to show up at the airport with your gun in a hard-sided case, not a typical soft case. Hard case that protects both the guns and, I guess, the people if they think it, it makes a difference. But at any rate, get a hard-sided case that's lockable. You've got to be able to put locks on it. Some airlines will say you need two padlocks or two combination locks or something. Um... The TSA will say something a little bit different from the airlines. Pretty, pretty much comes down to the airlines. They're usually a little more strict. And they'll say, all right, you've got your hard case. It's locked. Your gun's inside. You've got the key. You get to the desk and say, hey, I want to check in for my flight. I'm checking a firearm. This goes into the luggage along with your baggage and stuff. You don't carry it on. <laughs> you used to do that in the 60s. You don't do it anymore. 
And they'll say, oh, okay, um, you'll need to open it up, sign this little form that says, I have a gun in here and this little red or orange tag. You sign it, you date it, you put it inside the case, lock it all up again, and then they take it to TSA. Sometimes they give it to you and a TSA agent comes and you walk over and they run it through the x-ray. Sometimes they'll ask you to open it just to make sure, oh, yep, it is a gun, just like you said it was. I don't know why they do that. It's pretty obvious. But at any rate, they've checked it all out. It's all locked up. It's got your luggage tag on it. You've got another little tag that matches that luggage tag so you can claim it when you get there. It goes onto the plane along with the rest of your luggage. But when you get to the airport, your destination, it's probably not going to come out on the regular baggage carousel. It's going to go back either to a police department or the airline's luggage people, and they're going to want to see your proof of your tag says you match it. You'll describe what it is or something, show them a lot, your driver's license or a passport to prove you're who you are so somebody doesn't steal it. Makes sense. And then you grab it and you're on your way. Um, boy, that's just about all you need to know for flying with it. Now, ammunition is different. Uh, I think if, if it's the same, the last time I read it, TSA says you can have your ammunition in the same locked case as the gun, but most airlines don't. So go to the airline's website, say united.com, delta.com, whatever, and read what they say about traveling with guns in there. And they'll give you, a lot of them will say you can only have two guns in a case. Used to be, you could have three, four, five. Gosh, I think I, back in the day, I traveled with as many as six and it can be handguns as well as long guns. Some of them will say you should have a trigger lock on or the, the rifle or shotgun should be dismantled in some way. Uh, so just check on all those regulations from the airlines to figure that stuff out. Just to be on the safe side, I will generally slap a trigger lock on or remove the bolt from a bolt action. Sometimes I'll take the barrel off and have everything taken apart. I don't see how they can complain when you're like that. Um, but the, the ammunition probably needs to go in a different case. And this gets a little goofy with some of the airlines. Generally, here in the States, you can have your ammunition in a box. Factory box is what they like to specify, but you can get the aftermarket plastic boxes so long as there is an individual compartment for each cartridge. They don't want them in a bag rattling around. I think they fear that maybe, uh, a primer uh, will get struck by a sharply tipped bullet or something and set them off. Don't know if that's ever happened, but they just want them in a box where they're controlled. So I like to tape my boxes so they don't pop open and then you lose your ammunition inside of your luggage bag. But I'll generally have my a box of cartridges or two and I'll shove them, I'll wrap them up in a coat after I've taped them shut and or shove them into a boot or something to just add a little more protection and control and put them in my regular luggage bag. They've always allowed that except for in some African countries. Over there, they insist that you put it into another locked hard-sided case, which is a real pain in the butt uh, because you've got to check it as another piece of luggage and it might be only this big, tiny little thing. You know, it's silly. I like to put them in a bigger piece of luggage like that. And some of the airlines over there will let you do that and some won't. So you really do need to look into that. Um, and then there's the number of cartridges you can take. Most of the airlines will say no more than, I think, 11 pounds. So it, it really limits what you can take for shot shells, for example, or big bores, like you're taking a 416 or a 450 or something over to Africa with three to 400 grain bullets on it. You don't get a lot of those in before you're over your weight limit. But with standard cartridges, it's usually not a big issue. Um, and you can have reloads, but your reloads, um, in the foreign countries, they're going to check your ammunition and you've got to better match up the uh, cartridge designation on your barrel with the head stamp on the back. For example, you can take a 30 out six case and if you're a hand loader, you can neck it down to 280 Remington or 270 or 25 out six, but it'll still say 30 out six on the head stamp. If your rifle then says 25 out six Remington, they're going to look at the head stamp and that and say, eh, this isn't going to work, guys. So make sure those things match up. That's probably more information than you needed, Robert, but I thought I'd be thorough. And I think I covered it all. But if I missed something, 
somebody write in and set us straight. And of course, remember, it could all change tomorrow. <laughs> you just never know what the different governments are going to do and the airlines and all the rest of it. So I always check what the latest rules are on the airline sites, at least. And if you're going to a foreign country, you're going to have your outfitter, your PH over there, help you out and let you know what the latest is over there. All right. Well, let's go to Arizona now where Christopher asks something about arthritis. Hmm. I have developed arthritis in my right shoulder. I'm stepping down to a 7 millimeter 08 Remington with a one and eight and a half twist so I can still shoot moose, caribou, and elk with a 150 grain Barnes TTSX bullet and or Norma 160 grain tip strike. I know that's not very manly, but I'm 73. Oh, so he's asking if I think he's, those are going to work. Yeah, those are going to work just fine for you. Um, hey, 73 and you're still hunting, man. More power to you. Moose, caribou, elk, 150 grain, TSX, beautiful. And that's going to work out just fine. Um, I've used even lighter TTSX bullets on those. I've gotten down as light as 120 grain copper bullet, but it wasn't the Barnes. It was a um, Lost River Ballistics J36 out of a 6.5-06. And I took a big bull moose with one shot with that bullet. Those copper bullets just penetrate so well. So as long as you deliver them to the right spot, <laughs> they're going to work just fine for you. The tip strike, I'm not that familiar with. Norma makes great ammunition. 160 grain bullet is is Pretty good weight behind it for a 7mm 08. And I just can't remember if the tip strike is a controlled expansion bullet or just a standard cup and core with a plastic tip. I think it's the latter, but you want to double check on that. That might get a little bit iffy. The issue with bigger animals like moose and elk are that if you've got a fairly soft frangible bullet, it could pancake against major muscle and bone and or break up and not penetrate as far as you would like. So do a little more research on that. But boy, I can stand behind that Barnes TTSX. Good luck, Christopher. I hope you do well despite your arthritis. I just love to hear of folks getting out there and pushing aside all these little problems that we eventually come down with and uh, keep going, man. Don't give up. All right, let's go to New Jersey. Eric. Do you know why there are so many different cartridges for rifles, but not handguns? Thank you, Eric. <laughs> That's a good, simple question, Eric. Boy, I got to think on that for a moment. Uh, I probably, because more people are interested in rifles for hunting, for target shooting, we've just been more of a country of riflemen. Handguns have always sort of been a last line of defense or a convenience for backup. You go hunting and you're worried about a bear, you might pick up a 44 mag or 454, a 460, a 10 millimeter or something. But I just don't think there's as many different uses for handguns. Consider rifles for hunting, you're going to want a 22 for small game, right? And then you're going to go up to buffalo, elephants, dangerous game, and you're going to want a huge bullet and cartridge, the 450s, the 470s, the 500s. Yes, there are some handguns that'll shoot a 50 caliber bullet. Um, and 45s, obviously, those have been around for a long, long time, 44s, but it just seems like a handful of them seem to cover the field pretty well. But actually, if you look at it that way, the same thing applies to rifles. Who can deny that we have an oversupply of options in our rifle cartridges? But I think there's just such a demand for the newest and the greatest and, and playing the ballistics game and everything that riflemen seem to fall for the new a little more than the handgunners do. Because if you have a, a 10 millimeter or a 357 Magnum or a 38 Special, okay, that you know what that's for and you've got it. You've got it covered. You're not looking to improve things for a, an extra 50 yards of range or something. Whereas with the rifles, they're always tweaking it. They want to win another contest. So they want more accuracy or they like to reach a little bit farther or hit a little bit harder and all the things. There's just more demand for rifle stuff. That's the only answer I can come up with, Eric. If anyone else out there has a, a better idea of why there are fewer cartridges for handguns, let us know. 
but that's the best I can come up with. All right, let's go to uh, up to Canada, Eastern Manitoba, eh? Hayden. Hi, Ron. I've been following along for quite some time. This winter, I had the goal of harvesting a wolf. With our insane wolf populations and our crazy low deer populations, I figured I'd try to do my duty. I have a 7mm 08. Ah, that's the second 708 mentioned on this uh, episode. And I've used that 708 for deer and moose in the past, shooting the Hornady 150 grain ELDX and 130 grain CX. That's Hornady's all copper bullet, depending on the range and the animal. Well, after a few months of baiting and seeing these wolves on my cameras, I finally was able to get one. I shot it from my spot around 230 yards away. Wolf went down. Great. My problem is the 7mm ELDX blew a 6-inch hole in the side of the wolf. <laughs> this can be fixed, but it's not ideal, especially on a perfect specimen such as the one I shot. So then I went and called a few buddies to get some advice on smaller cartridges and rifles for fur and pelt-bearing animals. I was recommended cartridges such as the 22250 Remington, the 220 Swift, the 223 Remington, the 25 out 6 the 6 and the 6 5 Creedmoor, etc. Then came my last call where this friend said, screw it, I'm buying a new rifle, but instead find a different cartridge for the 7mm that won't mushroom as much, like a target load, thus ideally saving the pelt. We chatted for a while and it seemed to make a lot of sense to me, but will this still give me a clean kill for a wolf without it suffering? My question is, that a re is that a reasonable thing to do? Would that solve my problem of blowing a giant hole in the wolf? Thanks and look forward to your professional opinion, Hayden. Okay, Hayden, you're essentially asking for a good fur bullet. And as a long-standing coyote hunter, I played around with that lots and came up with a really fast frangible bullet that doesn't exit. 204 Ruger is a great example for coyotes. The bullet gets in, explodes inside, kills the animal quickly, almost never exits so you don't tear up the hide. Every once in a while, you just hit the wrong place and the bullet explodes on the surface or it somehow does slide through the lungs and explodes out the backside, but very rarely. I did the same thing with the 22250. I used a lighter bullet, super explosive. Um, Hornady used to have one called the SX and I Stood for super explosive, really thin jacket, soft lead core, and you couldn't even drive it to typical velocities out of a 220 Swift or a 22250. It had to download it a little bit because you could spin it apart. <laughs> so, but hey, it, it worked great once I hit the coyotes with that. It would go in and stay in. So the 17s do that. But with a wolf, you got a much larger animal there, and you might be a little more concerned about the bullet being big enough to do the job. I think a 22250 would certainly work. I would sure try it. But I think a better option might be to start with a 24 like the 243 Winchester, any of your six millimeters, but stick with those fairly light frangible bullets. The idea being, of course, to stay inside. The other option is a bullet like a, a Barnes X. Um, I don't know that if you shot your wolf with the CX bullet, I would have thought you wouldn't have had a big hole in it. The ELDX, I can see that one tearing a big hole in the side. But the harder your bullet, the more controlled its expansion, the less you should be tearing it out. But it, it always depends on where you hit. If you strike major muscle and a chunk of bone, you could be blowing that bone through and out the backside too. So there's never an absolute guarantee on this. But I have found that if I use a good controlled expansion bullet, even in the larger cartridges like the 708, um, and sometimes even a 7 rem mag, that you can shoot through and have a small exit hole. You just don't want a bullet that really expands a lot and or breaks up and still has enough power to shoot through. So you'll have to experiment a lot on your own, but any of those you mentioned could work with the right bullet. But I think you are on the right track by paying more attention to the bullet and less to the cartridge itself. Now, let's see. If I don't know. Iowa. Yeah, let's go to Iowa. Someone named Briggs is asking about, oh, a 204 Ruger. Here we go. Hey, what's the best 204 Ruger upper? I want everything out of the 204, so maybe a 24 inch and a 1 in 12 twist barrel. I already have two great ARs from Rock River, Ames, 
A-M-E-S, so I could just swap out the uppers. I'm looking for a good brand with a complete upper. Also, do you have to have a new magazine for the 204? Can I use the 223 magazines? What do you think about the 204 Grendel? We're going all over now. <laughs> I love your videos. Keep doing it. Okay, Briggs, I appreciate that. I might not have the absolute answer here for you. Now, the 204 Ruger was made from the... Um, 222 Remington Magnum, which is longer than the 223. I don't remember what the longest actual complete bullet cartridge overall length of it is. I think it's about the same as the 223, but the case itself is a little bit longer than the 223s. So it should work in the magazine. The rim diameter, the body diameter, all that's the same. Uh, so I think it's going to work in your standard 223 magazines. And of course, the bolt face head size the same on that so it should work just fine by swapping out the uppers who makes the best uppers i don't know i don't work with ars all that often there are plenty of them out there more than plenty i think you're gonna have to do your own research on that one and then the 204 grendel i don't even know but i imagine it's what a six millimeter grendel uh neck down to 20 that's getting down there pretty far. I haven't heard about that one yet. Might work out pretty well, but it might be a barrel burner too, because that seemed like a lot of powder for a 20 caliber. So yeah, I, I think Briggs that you might have loved my videos in the past, but you're probably not loving my answer right now. <laughs> oh gosh. But I do like the 204 Ruger. I think that's a a good economical little cartridge to use for fur, especially if you hand load. Buy your cartridges and, you know, there's just, it just seems like the prices of ammunition don't reflect the actual materials within them. It's, it's more of a what's popular in the volume. That's why the 308s are usually fairly inexpensive in the 223s. Or in shotgunning, you can buy a box of 12 gauge with an ounce and a half of shot cheaper than four tens with a seven eighths of an ounce or less of shot. So it's kind of crazy. But uh, if you're a hand loader, you can really work that 204 uh, Ruger to your advantage. So good luck with it. Why don't you uh, check it all out? Maybe you could write back and let us know what you discovered. And you can be the expert on the 204 Ruger in an AR. And that looks like the end of our questions. So I think we had a pretty good episode this time. I hope I helped out with the uh, description of the ballistics coefficient and maybe helped you understand a little more about what that all does for your shooting. Uh, it really is important, even under 300 yards or even under 200 yards when it comes down to retained energy. So thanks everyone for your questions. Thanks especially to our patrons. Uh, they really uh, are important for keeping things churning around here. If you're interested in helping us out, would like to become a patron of Ron Spomer Outdoors, just go to Patreon dot com ron spomer outdoors and all the instructions for signing up would be right there and we would be most appreciated and would really love to have you so until next time let's all hunt on us and shoot straight